when these people met one another, they did interbreed, they had sex with one another and they often had offspring. And sometimes, depending on the distance, evolutionarily speaking, that they had separated, sometimes the offspring had difficulty in terms of having offspring of their own, and sometimes they didn't. It just depends on the nature of uh, the divergence between them. In this diagram from a paper in 2014, you can see the evolutionary tree with modern humans here on the left, Denisovans in the middle, and Neanderthals on the right. And these red arrows indicate interbreeding events between these various groups. And so you can see that we now have multiple cases where Denisovans interbred with modern humans, where Neanderthals exchange DNA with Denisovans, and we now have even more evidence. In fact, almost every single case of um, human remains at Denisova Cave show that at some point in their uh, ancestry, there was an interbreeding event with another group. Denny, for example, has hundreds of years before um, Neanderthal uh, uh, ancestry uh, from a much older period. So it's a very common thing. Now, since then, we've gone on to sequence um, to obtain more um, human remains using the Zooms method. And we've now found almost more um, human bones using this technique than we have in um, archaeology and identified archaeology in the site. And what's happened now at Denisova is we have a very interesting case where we have a series of occupations through time of about 300,000 years from the lowest to the most recent, which shows that there is a periodic um, interstratification of these different groups. So for example, at the bottom here, we have Denisovans, then re they're replaced by Neanderthals. Then we have um, Neanderthals higher up, Denisovans again, then Neanderthals, then Denisovans. And then at some point we have Homo sapiens, but finding Homo sapiens has been very, very difficult. What's really intriguing though, is what happens later in the sequence at Denisova Cave. Because at about 45 to 50,000 years ago, we get the appearance of these things. These are personal ornaments. And they're very important archeologically because they denote some kind of change in behavior where people are expressing themselves in symbolic and therefore very interesting cognitive ways. These are pierced animal teeth of mammals like reindeer and uh, sometimes carnivores as well. On the right hand side here, you've got some eggshell uh, ornaments made from ostriches. You've got here some buttons and some rings and plaquettes made from animal bones as well as mammoth ivory. And so one of the big questions in archaeology is who made these things? Who made them? At the moment, the most parsimonious explanation seems to us to be that it's Denisovans because the Denisovan remains are very closely commingled with the remains that you're seeing here in some areas, in some cases. But it's it's, it's equally possible, I think, that um, anatomically modern humans like us could have made them too. But at the moment, the, um, the debate is uh, still ongoing and to, to try to, um, to, to work out this um, and to figure out who was responsible for making these amazing objects at the site. In 1980, at a site called Baishia Cave, which is on the Tibetan Plateau in Western China, a monk was praying, it's a holy cave, you can see these people here, and as uh, is their custom, he took a handful of dirt on his way out to um, deposit at the, at the entrance to the cave. And that's when he noticed something. It was a small piece of bone. Thank goodness he picked it up. He noticed it was something unusual. He gave it to his lama uh, at the monastery. And the lama, who was a very educated man, kept it because he knew it could be significant. It wasn't until the 1990s, some almost 20 years later, that a local um, paleoenvironmental researcher came to visit and he was shown this and he took it to see whether he could find out anything more about it. The, um, the bone then laid around until 2016 when some other researchers came upon the scene and decided to investigate it. And it wasn't until the Max Planck and Jean-Jacques Hublin, the researcher there got involved and um, realized the significance of this, um, this jawbone that uh, some science was done on it and some proteins were extracted that suggested that this was the remains of a Denisovan. The teeth are very similar to some of the teeth that we have seen already from the site. And so it looks as though Denisovans were now present in another site in Eastern Eurasia. What do Denisovans look like? Well, you can imagine it's really difficult to know because we hardly have any of their remains, but recently Israeli scientists have been working on an approach using um, a very curious chemical switch that takes place in DNA which is um, the emergent field of epigenetics. And it enables us to make predictions about what people look like based on the methylation patterns that we see in the DNA. 
And what they showed is that in some cases, Denisovans appear to look very similar to Neanderthals. You see here, they've got a quite a triangular shaped rib cage like a Neanderthal. But in other cases, they seem to be closer to modern humans. So for example, in some of the, the digits and some of the hand bones that they have. So this really is um, an exciting breakthrough, I think. And it gives us um, hope that even though we don't have as yet many bones of Denisovans, we can start to put um, flesh on the bone, the bone, bony remains that we do have. And this has led to some really nice reconstructions of what Denisovans may have looked like. I particularly like this one by the very talented artist Tom Bjorklund, um, who's represented here the bones, the, bo the, the reconstruction of Denisova III that comes from that little tiny pinky bone I mentioned at the beginning. Another thing that we found out recently is the more about the Denisovan contribution to modern human biology and the modern human condition. So in um, 2018, a really stunning insight into ancient population structure was published um, in this paper in 2018 by uh, the Brownings, as it's called. And what they did here was they extracted archaic uh, DNA from modern human populations, and they pulled out all of that DNA and they tried to match it using powerful statistical programs against uh, uh, against um, uh, uh, the, the uh, Denisovan and the Neanderthal genomes compared with the living human genomes. And you can see here that the, um, they created a kind of heat maps. So for Iberian Spanish people, they found that most of the hits were towards the Neanderthal genome, which is un not unexpected because we know that people in that part of the world inherit Neanderthal DNA. But when they looked at Han Chinese people, they also found that they found um, Neanderthal DNA, but they also found two cases of Denisovan DNA, not just one, but two. And this suggested for the first time that there had been two separate integrations of Denisovan DNA into living people in this part of the world, but from two different populations. So we now know that there are at least two, perhaps even three different populations of Denisovans living in Eastern Eurasia. We also know that Denisovans contributed um, important uh, genetic variants to living people. For example, we know now that the EPAS1 gene variant, which is found in Tibetans, comes from Denisovans. And why this is important is that without this variant, Tibetans can't live at high altitude and have children. It enables them to overcome problems of hypoxia. Without this, they wouldn't be able to live there. In Greenlanders, we now know that two genetic variants found in them are associated with this brown fat, which is a really amazing um, adaptation that allows children to burn calories and heat themselves in cold environments. And there are other benefits to having these too in cold environments, these genetic variants. And finally, and recently, we also are, have become aware of uh, gene variants that are associated with immune response and the ability of people to fight tropical diseases. So for example, this gene variant, TNFAIP3, is found amongst Oceanians and people living east of the so-called Wallace's line, which demarcates um, the Australasian um, land mass of mammals from the continental. And these are found amongst Oceanians and nowhere else. And they give people this ability to avoid um, inflammatory um, spontaneous responses to um, certain diseases. So in summary, in this very brief overview of Denisovans and the wider picture of, uh, of our human ancestry, it's important to remind ourselves that uh, the, uh, the, the genus Homo and our, our ultimate ancestry has become a lot more interesting and a lot more complex over the last uh, 20 years. It's instead of um, just us, it turns out that there's a whole middle earth of people that once lived on the earth and they overlapped with each other and they met each other and they uh, gave us genes that we now carry with us to this day, in some cases a quite high proportion. So we have um, a very interesting story uh, to tell. Um, and I want to very quickly acknowledge some of my um, collaborators and colleagues who've worked on this with me and the work of many scientists and many archeologists from around the world um, through which I have been able to tell some of these stories. I thank all of them very, very much. And I also thank, um, I'd like to thank um, finally my agent, Joanna Swainson for her great work and helping me to write this book and also at um, Viking and Penguin Random House, Connor Brown, Daniel Crew, and Chloe Daniels. And I'd also like to thank you for, um, for listening and to, for attending this um, launch, which I'm um, experiencing sadly on my own in my office. Thank you very much. <laughs>
God, this is so exciting. It's, it's really revelatory. And for someone who is so inexperienced in this field, it's wonderful finally to see how these things are pieced together, mind-boggling science. It's extraordinary that you're a storyteller and you tell your stories from something that is two and a half centimeters long. I know, this is the thing. I mean, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really incredible. I, I, I keep sort of saying to myself that I'm very fortunate to be living through what I think is the golden age of research into human origins. And I'm really interested in the use of scientific techniques on the archaeological record and what they can tell us. And, you know, we're very fortunate because over the last 20 to 50 years, archaeology, we've, we've really benefited from research that has taken place in a load of other disciplines. You know, you think of things like CT scanning. You know, this is a medical scientific breakthrough that's very useful for people who want to know, you know, where their cancer is or how sick they are. But we use it to scan ancient bones and, you know, to look inside ancient, ancient materials and to understand more about the histology and the shape of the bones and so on and so forth. And it's the same with DNA, ancient DNA. Um, it's, it's been an absolute revelation and, and a revolution in, in, uh, in, in this field. So it's a really exciting time to be working in this area because we can tell so much from such tiny, tiny bones. You've partly answered the question I'm about to ask you, which is why do you think for so long we, we didn't anticipate there being these hybrid populations. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. And, you know, it's interesting because um, a couple of years ago, uh, colleagues of mine here at the university, they published this paper, which used a small amount of the um, variable regions in the mitochondrial DNA as a way of predicting whether or not two species could interbreed with one another successfully and have offspring. And what they showed was that we should have known, we should have been able to predict that it could have happened. And, you know, it's really, it's really hard to, to, to look back and think, well, why didn't we? There's some people that did think that humans um, had met and Neanderthals, for example, and interbred with them. But the evidence just wasn't there until we got the nuclear genome. And it, it really took technology to, to catch up. Paleoanthropologists, a very small number of them, had actually looked at some, um, some ancient remains and said, this looks as though there is some sort of degree of hybridization going on. But it wasn't uniformly accepted because the, the evidence just wasn't quite persuasive enough. And it really wasn't, for people like me at least, it wasn't until you know, we, got, we got the genome data that really demonstrated it to, to absolutely um, no doubt that, uh, that there had been this interbreeding um, at, 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 and so on in these ancient uh, bones. And now that we have the ability to sequence ancient DNA, we're now finding that this happened regularly and it happened in different locations multiple times. And so, yeah, again, it, in, the, in the cold hard light of day, it perhaps isn't surprising. Thanks for that Israeli research that you showed us and those, those drawings, we're able to get some sort of sense of the differences and similarities between the species. But could you offer us maybe a contemporary analogy from the animal kingdom to give us a sense of just how different Homo sapiens was in your view from the Denisovans and uh, from the Neanderthals? I mean, are we talking about lions and bears or are we talking about no, no. tigers and cheetahs? I mean, yeah, we're talking more about it, more in terms of the tiger, tiger and cheetahs. I mean, there, there's been a lot of uh, discussion and debate about this. And for many years, um, particularly with Neanderthals, um, researchers have have looked at trying to explain, um, you know, what the differences might be. and. The, the Neanderthals in particular have been um, very, very poorly represented over the last century and a half, and people have tended to, to rather look, look down on them. And there's a fantastic book that was published that some of your listeners may have even, um, may have even read um, called Kindred by Becky Rag Sykes, which really sets the record straight. I have a chapter in my book about Neanderthals, but um, it goes back to early reconstructions of what Neanderthals may have looked like. And they were, they were often represented as rather short and rather squat, rather brutish looking with very pronounced cheekbones and rather, um, you know, sticking out um, snouts and so on. And nowadays, um, when we look at um, reconstructions of Neanderthals, the, the, we have a, a rather different um, uh, view of what they, what they may have looked like. And people have suggested that, you know, you might think that there were some, some differences that you would um, register as being apparent, like a slightly thicker brow ridge and slightly, slightly shorter and so on and so forth and broader and bigger. But 
not grossly different. It wouldn't really, I don't think, um, make you look twice if you saw them uh, on a bus or on a public place. How far along the road are we, Tom, from working out how inevitable or not it was that Homo sapiens became the dominant force and that the Denisovans and the, and the Neanderthals in their original forms, I mean, as you say, we've got some of their yeah. DNA and some of their yeah. genetics, and that's helped us. But how inevitable was it that the Homo sapiens became the, the, the dominant force on the planet? So I don't think it was inevitable. Um, I think that we know now that instead of modern humans, as we so grandly call ourselves, sweeping uh, across um, Eurasia and, and depopulating um, the people that had been living there before, uh, that actually there was a much more subtle relationship going on. And some of the work that we've done shows that there was about a 10,000 year, at least 10,000 year overlap between these various populations. They weren't living side by side, but they were living in, in, in similar regions. And they certainly had contact with each other. We know that from the beginning of the genomic revolution. We know that, um, for example, um, Neanderthals and modern humans interbred from about 55 to 60,000 years ago. We know they've interbred up until about 40,000 years ago. So we have periods, we can detect this now in ancient bones. And so it wasn't an inevitable. Um, and I think that actually what happened was that during the course of this long period of overlap and contact, that both groups interact with, interacted with one another and may have benefited from that process. They may have um, you know, exchanged ideas, they may have exchanged um, aspects of culture. And it's only at 40,000 years ago that we find Neanderthals disappearing from the world. We don't know when Denisovans disappeared. It, it may be that they survived much later. There's, there are hints of that in the, um, in, in the um, island Southeast Asian story. Um, and similarly, we don't really know when hobbits um, went extinct, but um, I think it was a much more subtle process. And I think ultimately the reason um, has a lot to do with demography and demographics. We know from some of the genomic work, for example, that Neanderthal, Neanderthals were not uh, very populous. They may have been only five or 6,000 Neanderthals at any one time in these great um, swathes of Eurasia. So they were very thin on the ground. And recent modeling work has suggested that a slow drip drip of new uh, homo sapiens coming out of Africa and coming into these parts of the world could have been enough to tip the balance against them and either send them into extinction or facilitate their further assimilation into growing um, numbers of homo sapien populations.